hard to play. Oh, hey guys, welcome to uh, Corona Lessons, part um, 19 maybe? Yeah, you know, I woke up this morning and I was thinking about that old Fleetwood Mac song there. It's called Never Going Back Again on Rumors. And uh, I was thinking, man, I should learn that. I never, I never learned that. I always loved it, you know. And uh, man, is it harder than I thought it was. Holy shit. I've been working on it all morning and I can't even get close to making it feel the way he makes it feel. Lindsey Buckingham. I mean, he's got that shit. He's playing that finger picking stuff and he's got it swinging and grooving so hard and he's playing those notes really hard. He's he's making them poke out, you know, with his right hand. Shit, that's hard. Okay, so like, like on this five chord, look what he's doing. He's going, he's going. Wait a minute. That's what he's playing. It's, it's just impossible. It's like he's going. With his top fingers while he's going. With his thumb. making it feel amazing and it's hard and it's and it's in the pocket it's just incredible I mean we all know how great Lindsey Buckingham is and what an artist and visionary he is but I'm gonna tell you even more today you know my, my wife is like the biggest Fleetwood Mac fan that ever lived I mean she is obsessed with them and I love them too you know um, I remember one time uh, years ago uh, Dave Stewart produced a record on uh, Stevie Nicks, a bunch of her old demos, you know, that that she wanted to re-record. Some of the stuff went back to the 80s, you know, and so we got a band together and we worked at Blackbird Studio in Nashville for a couple of weeks and we made a really fun record. Wadi, Wadi Wachtel produced it and um, man, it was great. Dave Stewart was hanging around and uh, man, it was just cool to like, you know, be able to sit and I guess Stevie is fun to talk to, you know, she's got her girls around her, you know, and she, she, as long as you ask her a fun question, man, she'll just light up and tell you all these great stories. She's, she's a sweet Midwestern gal, you know, I really thought she was great. This is many years ago. And, um, you know, uh, my, I, I was able to bring my wife by the studio a couple of times, you know, after we got done recording and to meet Stevie, who's like her idol, you know, and uh, man, it was great. So then years later, um, uh, Stevie did a gig in, uh, or Fleetwood Mac did a gig at the Bridgestone, you know, and, and um, the, they were kind enough to invite some of the people that played on the record to come hang at the concert. We went backstage, you know, after, afterwards, and it was great, you know. And um, I had been obsessing over that song, that Lindsey Buckingham thing called Hold Me on, uh, on the Mirage album, 1982. You guys know that song? It was a hit record. And, um, Lindsey Buckingham is the master of the overdub. I mean, his his layering of guitars on records is just not to be believed. It's It just blows my mind, man. Like, if you listen with headphones at what he's doing on these overdub tracks, it's so weird and so cool. And he's always thinks of the, like, the most bizarre thing, and it just, it just sounds amazing. Like, on Hold Me, I mean, amongst all the incredible electric guitars that, that sort of just pop in and out of the track, um, there's acoustics that are like, there's like a breakdown part in the middle where he goes into this like angelic acoustic thing and it's just, it's just incredible. I mean, who would think to do that, you know? So I'd been obsessing over that that song and uh, I, I, I was backstage after they got done playing, you know, and I saw Lindsay over in the corner and uh, I never met him before or anything. I don't know him. I, I knew Stevie a little, like I mentioned. And uh, so uh, I waited, a bunch of people were trying to talk to him and everything. And uh, and I just waited around and, and uh, finally there came a little break in the action and I just I just walked up to him and I said, hey man, um, can I ask you a couple qu uh, question about about a song? And, and And right as I asked him, a bunch of his like handler guys kind of pulled him away, you know, and he, they wanted him to go somewhere else, you know, and, and, and he stopped them and he goes, he goes, hold on a second. He, goes, he wanted to ask me something. And, and I said, uh, I said, yeah, man, I mean, I've, I've been obsessing over uh, the song, Hold Me. I mean, can you tell me anything you remember about, about doing the overdubs and recording that? 
And he was like, oh, interesting. You know, I think he thought it was a cool question or something, you know, like, because he really sat and pondered it for a minute. And uh, I honestly don't remember a lot of the things that he said, but I do remember that he said, you know, Christine brought me that song as a, as a real slow thing. It was a real sad, kind of a slow song. And I thought it would be a lot cooler to do it like up tempo and faster. And, and uh, I think I think at first there was a lot of resistance, but look what ended up happening when you let a visionary like that run with something. I mean, oh man, what a, what a sick track. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to show you guys what it's like for a guy like me, like to, you know, I, I can't play everything and, and I can't, I can't make everything feel the way it feels on the record. I'm try, try like hell, like I mentioned in several volumes, you know, but that's a, that's a good example of a song that you can try to learn that, that never going back again, that just, you could spend a lifetime trying to make it feel the way it feels on that record, the way he plays it. It's just effortless for him because he's such a great finger picker. And it's such a second nature thing for him. But, you know, for a guy like me, who's really not a... I don't even have any kind of, you know, picking nails. And I think that's what he does, I'm pretty sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. But I know a lot of the guys that play that style have the long thumbnails and all that. I've never done that. I respect people that want to go there. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. I would never want to do that personally. But when you hear somebody that has been doing that their whole life, it's pretty awesome. Although it's kind of gross, isn't it? That long nail... <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm going to talk about one other thing about Lindsey Buckingham. Um, my wife and I were playing this silly gig last night, and we and we we played that song uh, "Dreams." You know, we played a gig into a computer. That's the times we're in, people. Using a thing called Stage It, we had to set up in our little office over there and play a gig to a bunch of people online through a fucking computer. To a Luddite like myself, this is not cool. Um, I mean, hell, I could barely work this iPhone that I'm doing these videos on. Okay, remember that song, Dreams? I wanna show you one little thing about that. You know, this, the song is basically just two chords, back and forth, you know, F. G. We all know this song. Huge record. Amazing record. As soon as it comes on, it's immediately a world. As soon as you hear the opening bit of that, that killer drum riff, it takes you, it's a world. The velvety, sort of soft uh, sounds and the big fat analog sort of wave that, that, that opens that song is just like, it's like catnip for people. They, as soon as you hear that, it just makes the hair in the back of your neck stand up, don't it? it? does for me. That song creates a real atmosphere, and it's incredible. But anyway, enough of that. It's two chords. We all know it, right? But when he gets to the chorus, when he goes, you know, Thunder only happened, that part, the guitars are like, he goes... Actually, it's the pre-chorus bit. It's not the chorus bit. It's the pre-chorus, you know, when it says, uh... That part, right? He's working that major seven on the, on the... Which is really cool. And then he goes to a dominant seven on the G chord. And then to a big add nine with the G on top of the F chord. creativity in that is always just blown my mind. I mean, and the, not to mention the other electric guitar playing in that song, the way he uses the volume pedal and the chorus effect to create those, you know, all that stuff. Using that low A, he goes, that 
low third is such a vibe. It's so good. I love Lindsey Buckingham. He's amazing. He's wacky cat, but man, is he badass. Um, okay, so, you know, some of the, I'm still watching all the videos you guys have put up. It's killer. It's really great. Pretty, I guess I'm gonna have to pick a winner here pretty soon. Uh, maybe do that tomorrow, I suppose. So get your late night entries in. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as guitar players, right? You know, the, you know how silly magazines like Rolling Stone are always talking about the 100 greatest guitar players of all time and all that. What a totally subjective subject that is. I mean, uh, you, there's so many opinions about who are the greatest of all time. It's ridiculous to even talk about it. It's silly, you know, because there's just so many greats. People have asked me on some of the questions that, that they sent in, like, who are my top 10 favorite guitar players? I mean, that's a valid question. All you could ever say is, what are your personal top 10 favorites? You know, you, you, you can't say they're the greatest of all time. It's just what 10 guitar players affected you personally the most. That's all you could ever say. This, I, I, debating about stuff like that is just silly. You know, I mean, we all know that. Um, I mean, Dave Gilmore, for me, number one, always has been. I can't really do my top 10 list, but I'll just throw a few out there. I mean, I'll be thinking about that. Um, Pete Towns, definitely real high on the list. Um, like I mentioned, Steve Howe from Yes. I know that's probably very polarizing for some of you, but for me personally, uh, Elliot Easton from The Cars. I mean, uh, I just, I know uh, that's going to be very polarizing too, but man, his solos and his, his melodic playing on those early Cars records were a huge influence on me. As a matter of fact, I'll, at some point I'm going to show you all the i show you how to play that solo from uh, Just When I Need It, which is probably one of the greatest solos of all time, on the first album, 1977. So, uh, Andy Summers, I'm also a huge Police fan. Um, I mean, God. We played, when I was out in L.A., before the world ended, doing a record out there, and... Uh, we were playing that game where a couple of guys were all goofing around. We had this computer and Spotify open and you play the first second of a song and then shut it off and try to name it from the first second. You know, you've seen people do that with Beatles songs and all that. And they were doing me with the police and I got them all in one second. The opening thing I heard it, I knew what it was. I'm, I'm such a police fanatic. Zinjata Madada, the third album was one of my all time top 10, definitely favorite records. And, uh, you know, Andy Summers playing and, and uh, textures, just creativity is just incredible. Wow, I've been rambling. I'm rambling. I still got a bunch more guys to mention, but uh, that's just what I've been thinking about. All right. What else? I guess I guess that's it. Just just you know, get your videos in because I'm probably gonna be picking soon. I don't know what the prize is if you win. I saw one guy had a video called Tom Bukovac Contest Bragging Rights. I thought that was hilarious. Bragging rights. You you can win that. And I guess the winner or winners, maybe we'll all get together and uh, have a rolling rock together. Because <laughs> ah, you know I love rolling rock. All right. That's it, guys. Have a nice Sunday. Get out and play with your kids. Have fun. Okay, bye.